There is a suburb right outside Melbourne, Australia called Lower Plenty. Since its foundation, Lower Plenty has been a fairy tale for the families that have called the town home. People were born, played, worked, married, and died in dozens of generations. But this fantastical town was exactly that, a fantasy, where crime didn't exceed past a kid stealing a pack of playing cards from the local store. And eventually, what would break this peacefulness was a creature so horrific that some more paranoid victims would consider it to be almost supernatural. A demon, the devil, the beast, any damn title could be given to the monster that had terrorized the land down under. But the unanimous title given to this criminal was the Boogeyman. But a far more sinister pseudoname was created by the people of Lower Plenty. This is the horrific legend of Mr. Cruel. But before we get into this investigation, I would like to take a moment to mention that Pagan Valley is always creating more content for all of you. If you want to see more of these investigations, then like this video and subscribe to this channel. This lets YouTube know that Pagan Valley is becoming one of the best horror investigation channels on the platform. It is around 4 a.m. on a Saturday in 1987, the time where most families are at home fast asleep, but on this chosen morning, an urban legend was beginning to take form, in the shape of a masked man lurking outside of a family home. Removing a pane from the family living room window, this criminal made his way inside, alerting absolutely no one. This masked man made his way to the bedroom of the parents armed with a knife and a gun. He woke up the two parents, under the threat of lethal retaliation, pretending to be just a common thief that was interested in their personal belongings. Commanding the parents to roll over onto their stomachs, this criminal tied both of their hands and feet together, nullifying any plan of escape the two may have had in their tired, groggy, yet thoroughly alarmed state. This intruder utilized a type of knot commonly used by sailors or those with nautical experience. In an adjacent bedroom, the family's six-year-old son was awoken by the intruder but was kept relatively unharmed. The masked man blindfolded and gagged the boy with the same surgical tape and then tied him to his own bed. This is when the intruder made his true purpose known he made his way into the nearby bedroom of the family's 11-year-old daughter. Over the next two hours, this masked intruder would take breaks from his own perverted sexual desires to wander throughout the family's home, even stopping at one point to make himself a meal. After spending the better part of two hours sexually assaulting this poor 11-year-old girl, this mysterious psychopath left the house with a box of classic records and a blue jacket stolen from the family closet. Following the attack on the family in Lower Plenty, the police were obviously called and brought in to investigate the crime. Without a doubt, they were stumped. This attack seemed to come unprovoked, and the family had no real demons to look further into. The crime didn't seem to fit with any of the other open cases in the area either. So, police began to look into the assault and pick apart the pieces. The parents had been bound, gagged, and then locked inside their own wardrobe. The daughter, albeit in shock, revealed one of the strangest parts of the entire criminal case. The little girl was eventually able to tell police that the intruder used the family phone to call someone else during one of his breaks in attacking her. From what the girl heard, this call was a threatening one with the man demanding the person on the other end of the line to move their children or they would be next, and he referred to this unknown person as Bozo. Police then checked the family's phone records, but there was no record of this call whatsoever. It would later become clear that this was Mr. Cruel planting a red herring to purposely confuse investigators. 
he would successfully throw them off his scent for years to come. But it was over a year before Mr. Cruel struck again. Just days after Christmas in 1988, John Wills, his wife, and their four daughters were fast asleep in their Ringwood area home, a couple of miles southeast of where the previous crime had taken place. Wearing dark blue overalls and a dark ski mask, the suspect broke into the Wills' home and held a gun to John Wills' head. As before, he clutched a knife in his other hand and told the parents to roll onto their stomachs, then he bound and gagged them like before. The intruder assured the Wills that he was only there for money, but then he methodically cut the phone lines and made his way into the bedroom where the four Wills daughters all slept. Shocking detectives, 10-year-old Sharon Wills was wakened by the suspect, not physically, but by the suspect saying her name while standing over her. Detectives knew that at some point, whether while in the house, or more disturbingly, through a frightening amount of stalking, the suspect had known the daughter's name before entering the home. The man quickly woke her up, blindfolded her and gagged her, then picked up a few items of her clothing, and then fled the house with her early the next morning. After freeing himself and noticing that the phone lines were cut, John Wills rushed next door to the neighbor's house to use their phone to call the police. However, the suspect was long gone, and so was Sharon Wills. But 18 hours later, a woman stumbled upon a tiny figure standing on a street corner just after midnight. Dressed in green garbage bags, it was Sharon Wills. As Sharon Wills was reunited with her family, she gave police some startling clues as to who her attacker could be. Because Wills was blindfolded throughout her assault, she was unable to give a full physical description of the suspect, but she did recall how shortly before letting her go, the suspect made sure to give her a thorough bath. He not only washed off any forensic evidence he had left behind, but also clipped her fingernails and toenails and brushed and flossed her teeth. Investigators had quickly tied this incident to the previous one in the Lower Plenty and a domain of fear and apprehension was beginning to take shape in the Melbourne suburbs. And a name was beginning to spread through communities that would strike fear in families for years to come. Mr. Cruel struck a third time on July 3, 1990, in the suburb of Canterbury, Victoria, which is west of Ridgewood and south of Lower Plenty. Here resided the Linus family, a well-off English family who had been renting a house along the prestigious Monomyth Avenue. This distinguished neighborhood had been home of plenty of Australian politicians and public officials in its time, making it a secure area to live in, or so many believed. On that day, Brian and Rosemary Linus were attending a farewell party and left their two daughters home alone. Then just before midnight, 15-year-old Fiona and 13-year-old Nicola were woken by the ranting, commanding orders of a masked intruder. He told Fiona to tell her dad he needed to pay $25,000 for Nikki's safe return. He then took Nikki and stole the family's own rental car, a Holden Berlina, from the house. 36 hours after the kidnapping, Brian and Rosemary held a press conference begging for Nikki's safe return and agreeing to pay the ransom. 50 hours after the abduction, Nikki was discovered. She was fully clothed, wrapped in a blanket, wearing a blindfold, but still alive. She was dropped off at a power station in Kew, roughly five kilometers from the family's home. The offender repeatedly told Nikki not to peek from the blindfold, telling her, my freedom is worth more than your life. Nicola was able to offer the investigator some details that were vital to the investigation. Most notable among them was a rough estimate of the attacker's height, which was about 5 foot 8, 
Some details of her ordeal were far more horrifying though. She revealed that throughout her time in captivity, she was forced to lay down into a neck brace contraption that was fastened to the abductor's bed, restraining her while she was abused. On April 13, 1991, Mr. Cruel broke into the home of John and Phyllis Chan in the affluent Templestowe district of Victoria. That night, they trusted their 13-year-old daughter, Carmen, to watch over her two younger siblings. It seemed Mr. Cruel knew this, as detectives believed he would stake out his victims for weeks or even months ahead of time, learning their habits and movements. At roughly 8.40 that evening, Carmen and one of her sisters headed to the family's kitchen to make some food when they were startled by Mr. Cruel in his balaclava and a gray-green tracksuit. I only want your money, Mr. Cruel lied to the three girls, forcing the two younger siblings into Carmen's wardrobe. He claimed he wanted Carmen by herself to show him where the money was, and he then pushed the bed in front of the closet to lock the two younger sisters in as he made his escape. Minutes later, the two frightened sisters managed to push open the wardrobe doors and immediately call their father at the family restaurant. By the time the police arrived, they knew what to expect. They'd been to enough of Mr. Cruel's crime scenes to know what had taken place. Investigators found a note written in large, bold letters on Phyllis Chan's Toyota Camry shortly after the abduction. It read, Payback Asian Drug Dealer. More, more to come. But after combing John Chan's background, this proved to be just another one of Mr. Cruel's red herrings. Days later, the Chans posted an encrypted letter in the local paper, using a cipher that Carmen Chan would have been able to decrypt. They offered a hefty $300,000 ransom in exchange for the safe return of their daughter. Carmen Chan's abduction triggered one of the largest manhunts in Australian history, known as Operation Spectrum. It was a multi-million dollar undertaking that devoured tens of thousands of police man-hours alongside the many thousands of volunteer hours. Sadly, Carmen would never be reunited with her family. Nearly one year after Carmen's abduction, on April 9, 1992, a man walking his dog in the close-by area of Thomastown happened upon a fully decomposed skeleton. This was eventually revealed to be Carmen Chan. An autopsy revealed that Carmen Chan had been shot three times in the head, execution style, probably not long after her abduction. Theories have swirled as to why Mr. Cruel murdered Carmen when he released all his other victims. Carmen's mother theorizes that because her daughter was stubborn and would have fought against her attacker, she likely learned too much about him for him to let her go. Mr. Cruel was a cold and calculating monster who planned all of his crimes in advance. This fact convinced Victoria officers that Mr. Cruel was guilty of much more than the three sexual assaults and one murder. In 2016, the Australian press announced that the suspect named John, not his real name, had links to another unsolved murder. According to the authorities, John became a suspect sometime around 2011 where his partner told Task Force Apollo, a massive Victoria police operation designed to nab Mr. Cruel, that John had sadistic tendencies in the bedroom. This aligned with the 1991 FBI letter, which indicated that Mr. Cruel likely had a partner who was aware of his psycho-sadistic fantasies. This unnamed witness also said that John would talk about Carmen Chan during sex, and would become visibly nervous whenever television stations ran stories on Mr. Cruel. More to the point, John owned a gun and had a job that allowed him to travel all over Melbourne, and reportedly had a pornography collection at home that featured indecent images of children. 
Since 1991, the Victoria Police have proposed the idea that Mr. Cruel was responsible for 12 unsolved abductions of children in the Melbourne area between 1985 and 1995. Despite going underground for the better part of two decades, Australia detectives believe that Mr. Cruel is still alive and living in the Melbourne area in 2021. For years since 1991, the Australia police and media have leaked out bits and pieces of information regarding suspects in the Mr. Cruel case. One of them turned out to be a 75-year-old former lecturer at Melbourne University who was a, also a convicted sex offender. This suspect was unmasked by the media as Brian Allen Elkner. Between 1972 and 1974, Elkner attacked and sexually assaulted six women, including one of his students, in the Melbourne suburbs. Since Elkner was named as the primary suspect in the case, attention has been paid to a 1973 essay that he published in an academic book entitled French Aesthetic Thought in the 18th Century. The essay, Diderot and the Sublime, the artist as the hero, makes the case for the sublime criminal. Elkner wrote, If society establishes a new level above the amoral and determined the world of nature, the sublime individual, artist, or criminal stands above both, affirming his value in the face of an indifferent nature, a mediocre society. Elkner maintains his innocence and has yet to been charged with any crimes related to Mr. Cruel. One of the more common and popular theories about Mr. Cruel is that he worked as a school teacher during his crime spree. The circumstantial evidence supporting this theory includes the fact that he called out Sharon Wills by her first name during the attack on the Wills family. This presumably indicated some kind of intimacy with the young girl. Furthermore, one of the most tantalizing clues in the whole case is that both Nicola Linus and Carmen Chan were students at Presbyterian Ladies College. During the abduction of Nicola, Mr. Cruel had told her to take her school uniform with her. Another fact noted by investigators is that all of Mr. Cruel's attacks occurred during school breaks and holidays. Another theory investigators considered was that Mr. Cruel was a pornographer. The FBI said in their April 1991 letter that Mr. Cruel was a collector of homemade pornography. The accounts of Sharon Wills and Nicola Linus suggested that Mr. Cruel also made his own pornography. Specifically, both girls remember waking up in Mr. Cruel's house and seeing a camera and tripod at the foot of the bed. Decades later, the Victoria Police would publicize their belief that Mr. Cruel filmed all of his sexual assaults. This idea runs in conjunction with the theory that Mr. Cruel may have been involved in the shady child pornography forums that already existed during the early days of the internet. While officially the police have only stated that Mr. Cruel filmed his rapes to relive them later on, they never ruled out the idea that Mr. Cruel may have been a one-man creator and distributor of child pornography. Lastly, the crimes of Mr. Cruel have eerie similarities to another crime spree which took place around the same time but on a different continent. On October 18, 1974, in the university city of Cambridge, England, a 20-year-old student was settling down to view some television when she found a man with a scarf around his mouth watching her. The man threatened the woman with a knife. She was eventually sexually assaulted by the criminal who was first to be called the Hooded Rapist before earning the nickname the Cambridge Rapist. For nine months, the Cambridge Rapist broke into the homes of co-eds and other women who lived in the city. In total, he pulled off ten attacks on young women. The Cambridge Rapist clearly loved the sensationalism attached to his crimes. During one of his final assaults, he struck while wearing a black zipper mouth mask with the word Rapist written on it. This mask would later become a fashion accessory when Malcolm McLaurin, the man responsible for forming the Sex Pistols, 
However, the Cambridge rapist was ultimately pinned as Peter Samuel Cook, a career criminal with prior convictions for robbery and escaping from custody. However, Cook has declared his innocence multiple times. Mr. Cruel remains one of the most bizarre and horrifying unsolved mysteries in not just Australia, but the world's history. Investigators for almost four decades have tried to piece together who the culprit behind these grisly crimes was. But it has never been enough. Mr. Cruel was the equivalent of a phantom, and his meticulousness was so precise and his targets so sporadic that it left police whiplashed at every turn. But by far the biggest question still on the mind of the men and women who tried to crack the case was why Mr. Cruel finally resorted to murder. Detectives agree that it must have been unintentional, and Mr. Cruel truly had no desire to take human lives. As after strategically dumping the remains of the murder victim, Mr. Cruel immediately stopped his four-year spree. But without any closure, the area around Melbourne has never forgotten these events that ripped away a communal sense of safety they thought they had. Not to mention that all of this occurred during the kidnapping scare of the early 90s, where most western countries were becoming distrusting with neighbors and neighborhood friend groups had basically been eradicated. Regardless, Mr. Cruel has remained an urban legend, and as decades pass on, Younger generations are told more fantastical stories of this criminal, even using Mr. Cruel as a threatening figure that stole bad children. While just the thought of this psychopath still walking the streets, living a normal life again is disturbing, we may never know if it was Mr. Cruel's goal to make as big of an impact as he did. The legacy Mr. Cruel left behind was that of a monster birth from the sick, twisted desires of one man in a mask that permanently scarred people for decades and for years to come. Thank you for watching to the end of the video. Have you heard of the legend of Mr. Cruel? And what do you think about these horrific events? Let me know what you think down in the comments. These investigations are supported by all of you. So if you haven't already, why not like this video and subscribe to the channel? Pagan Valley is still growing, and I can't wait to share what else I have in store for all of you. For now, you all have yourself a pleasant evening, and I will see you in the next video.